I pray today that this message will inspire us to live for you more than ever before. Help us to see your love and your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I normally preach in series of different topics and things like that, right? And so this year, we started the year talking about faith in January. We hit on uh, what worship is in February. In March, we talked about just the Bible. We just talked about can we trust it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this week and next week, I'm not in the middle of a series. I'm just preaching on Palm Sunday, and I'm preaching on all Easter next week. And so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to talk about Palm Sunday uh, so I have three different truths about Palm Sunday for you. If you don't know, Palm Sunday is recorded in all four Gospels. It is when Jesus uh, walked, entered into Jerusalem, and is that whole story. That is uh, the recollection of Palm Sunday. Um, I'm going to read out of the book of John. All the scriptures are on the screen or pulled out on your phone or tablet. Or if you are old school and you actually like paper, you can do that as well. Um, but... You know, it's, it's, it's all good, right? Like, you're not a worse person for pulling it up on your phone. Um, I've got a little Bible reading plan I use on my own phone. It's all good. It's all gravy. So, um, but John chapter 12 is kind of where we're going to look, and then we're going to look at Psalms as well. But John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15, says this. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went up to meet him and cried, Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. I may exaggerate a couple of Hosannas. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Uh, it says, Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it, and is, as it is written. Here's another quote. Uh, Fear not, the daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. And what's cool about this is some of these quotes in John are actually quoted from the Old Testament, and we'll show you those as well. But the first truth I want you to see through this idea of Palm Sunday is simply save me. Or save now. Save us. Just depending on the translation and how it gets translated. translated. But the meaning is exactly the same. Save me. Save me. Now, and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, before Jesus could have been a prophet, um, he could have been a priest. Like they had different term, terms for him, teacher, all these things. But now he's going from just prophet to king, prophet to Lord. And he was stating his claim and who he was and their claim in their life. But what we were going to realize later on that it wasn't all maybe that they thought it was going to be. But this is a, this, what this is, this is a prophetic thing that is happening throughout Scripture because it was something that was said in the Old Testament that's being fulfilled in the New Testament. They're welcoming, welcoming him as the King of Israel. See, the word Hosanna, a lot of people think Hosanna means praise, 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 or just praise. So they're thinking, they're saying Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Praise him, praise him, praise him. It doesn't. It doesn't. It actually means save now. Hosan means save. Na, uh, na, N-A, means now. So it means save now. So what they're doing is like, save me, save me, save me, save me. Don't wait. Do it now. Right? Don't wait. I can't wait. I need it now. Psalms 118 says this. It says, Lord, save us. It says, Lord, save us. And that's what they're quoting. They're quoting Old Testament scriptures. In fact, it says, save us and then grant us success. And what they're doing is they're not only saying, God, save us, but they're bringing their own personal lives into <coughs> the equation. They're saying, save me. Save me. Or how many times do we have that exact same prayer thousands of years later? Lord, don't just save me, just don't help me, but do it now. Right? Do it now. Right? And it may even be that we did our own bad decisions. Right? I made this bad decision, this bad decision, this bad decision, this bad decision, and I got myself in this bind. And I'm going, God, save me. Just don't help, but save me now. Save me now. Now, um, as I've been reading the last couple weeks on this, uh, there's a scripture in Psalms 
It's called Psalms 107. That I just kept reading through and reading through and reading through. And it's really, really powerful. But it talks about how God saved them multiple, multiple times. So watch this. Watch what it says. Psalms 107, verses 4. And I'm going to just read little bits and pieces of the entire chapter. But my advice is just to take chapter 107, write it down, and read through it a bunch. Here's what it says. Verse 4 through 6. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, right in the middle of the desert. They had no place to go. You ever feel lost like you have no place to go? You're not alone. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Verses 11 through 13 says this. Because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. <laughs> you ever been there? So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. 18 through 20 says this. They loathed all the food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. 26 through 29. They mount up to the heavens. They do go down again to the depths. Their souls melt because of their trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and they are at their wits' end. Then they cry out to the Lord in trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. And then verse 31 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works. To the children of men. You see, at the end, he's not rebuking them for crying out. He's simply going, <laughs> in my opinion, he's kind of going, why didn't you do this all along? Why did you get yourselves in situations? I'm always going to be here for you. The scripture tells us that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. So, but why would you, why would you want to get yourself in a situation in the first place? It's like, I'm going to deliver you. I'm here for you. Man, can't you just thank me all the time? And it got me thinking that phrase, wit's end. I was like, that existed? <laughs> right? Wit's end. You ever feel like that? <clears throat> you had a job you don't like, teacher you don't like. You're just like, I feel like I'm at my wit's end. And I don't know what I'm going to do. We aren't alone. Because here's the thing when you think you're at your wit's end, that's when you feel lonely. That's when you feel all by yourself. You know, that's when you're like, nobody's paying attention. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I am isolated. I'm in a desert. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm desperate. I just don't know what to do. I'm at my wit's end. If you feel like that, I'm telling you, just read Psalms 107 on repeat. Read it every morning. Read it every afternoon. Read it every night. It's just one chapter. It's not that long. Right, it's two, three minutes. It's a two or three minute break, honestly, out of a cycle of negative thoughts that'll help you just continue to readjust. It happens to every person. You know, a lot of times when we get a what's in, people call people. You ever find yourself in that situation? Right, for some reason, because of what I do, I get a lot of phone calls and text messages and from people who are finding out their what's in. And I never claim to have all the answers, and I will never claim to have all the answers. But if you ever find yourself in that situation, just read Psalms 107. Read Psalms 107, because we are not alone. Right? I think of all, all, all the ages, right? We have newborns in the house, from elementary school kids to senior citizen. And I remember thinking, a couple weeks ago, I had this thought, like, I remember what it felt like to be at my wit's end, like in elementary school. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> right? You're like, this is the worst thing ever. Like, it was just something I remember, like, uh, so I moved to Colorado when we were, like, eight years old, right? So, like, you, you moved to a new state, across the country, didn't have a lot of friends, all this stuff. And we were homeschooled, right? So, like, normally if you move and you're in elementary school, at least you could have a school to go to. You could meet new friends in your classroom and all this kind of stuff. Um, and by the way, like when I was homeschooled in the 90s, okay, there wasn't like 14,000 homeschool groups that you could go to and you could meet 20 or 30 other kids your same age group. 
right? It was like, you, you had you and your mom and your siblings. Like, that is all you got. Like, that was your friend group, was your mom. Like, that was it, okay? <laughs> so, that's all I had. That's all I had. And I just remember thinking, I remember being outside. And this was back in the day. I hope they still have it. Remember, do they sell, like, the little cap guns? They make noise? And you had like the little like thing where they like you pull back the thing and they like shot it and then the little poof of smoke came out and made the little pop sound. I don't know if they still have those or not. But we for sure had them back in the day where they didn't have the orange tips on them, you know what I mean? Now hopefully they have the orange tips because we like to shoot them at people. <laughs> but like I remember playing outside with this little cap gun and going, I'm never gonna like this is horrible. I'm never going to have any friends, right? Like, obviously, I made it. I was okay, right? But, like, I was at my wit's end. Like, this is my whole life, just shooting my cap gun by myself in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, I was a really cool kid, you know what I mean? Like, there's reasons why we don't have pictures of me up when I was eight, nine years old, okay? There's reasons for it, y'all. At my wit's end. At my wit's end. But I wasn't at my wit's end yet. And it's through your life, you realize like more and more situations come up. And you're like, this is it. Forget it. You're at your wit's end. It's like, no, you're not at your wit's end, but it feels like you're at your wit's end. You feel like you're at your wit's end. What they're finding out now is interesting, is that we have people in leadership that are at their wit's end. Right, the, pandem the pandemic is kind of over. Right? It is. Not kinda. It is. Get over it. <laughs> I guess if you want to still be, I guess for you, you can. But, you know, for everybody else, we'll just move on and enjoy life and forget that it ever happened. But anyways, like, for, there's a whole group of people that never took time off of work, and they're always in the, like, in the decision-making chair. They're the ones having to make decisions for their companies and their organizations and everybody else. Did we do this? Did we send people home? Did we do and they're finding that those people who just worked all, like just kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going, now that everything is essentially settled, they're the ones that are crashing right now. The divorce rate is up for people in that situation. They're changing jobs like ever before. Why, because they just went, 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 and now they're like, I'm done. And they feel like they're at their wit's end, and, they're, and there's just so much movement with it. Why, because they're not reading Psalms 107. So what should you do? What should you do if you feel like you are at your wit's end? Because honestly, at some point in time, we will all feel that way. When we read things in Psalms 107, we're all going to feel that way. You're in the desert, you're hungry, thirsty, you don't know where to go. Do what Psalms 107 did and finally turn to death. So what do you do? What do you do? Because here's, here's what a lot of people do, and here's what we should do. We should go to wisdom. Right? We should go to wisdom. Because they've been there, done that. Right? I remember a couple of months ago, I don't know, a year or so ago, I was, I was in Walmart. It's a risky endeavor, I know. You just never know what you're going to get when you get to Walmart. And I was over by the, like, the yogurt. Right? The yogurt, cottage cheese, all that area. And I was getting yogurt. And an older couple came and they're, you kind of, you ever eavesdrop on people? If you don't, you're lying. Okay? <laughs> Liars. Okay? So I was eavesdropping their conversation. And I was like, hey, I was like, I gotta ask. I was like, how long have you guys been together? Because they were, you know, they were elder, they were, you know, struggling. And it was like 68 years they've been married. And I was like, whoa. It's like, what's the advice? You know, they had some jokes, this or that, and everything else. And, but why? Why did I ask? Because I wasn't trying to be like nosy. They've been together for 68 years. Like, that's a long time, right? Like, got any tips, buddy? He's like, yeah, she's always right, you know? She's like, that's right. My wife didn't even say amen to that one. But what do you do? You go to advice. Listen to the advice. Listen to the wisdom. And it really essentially kind of boils down to this. This is what I'm realizing. Having to give people advice sometimes and sometimes being right and sometimes being wrong. There are people who want advice, and there's people that just want you to tell them that they're doing something right, even if it's not. There's people who legitimately just like the drama, and they don't actually want to get out of it. 
They don't want to, they like the toxic relationship they're in. They actually don't want to get out of the toxic relationship. They like it. And here's how you know. If you get God, if, if you get godly advice and you know it's godly, and you don't want to follow it, you like the situation you're in. It's true. Like, if you have the advice, oh, this is godly advice, this is, right? I'm a guy, so we'll just throw men under the bus for a second, okay? If, a, if another guy comes to you, like, hey, how do I be a husband? And he points out biblical truths about being a husband and being a spouse and being a father. And that husband and that wants to play more video games and he does want him to be a husband, he doesn't actually want to be a godly husband. Right? He wants to be a boy in a man's body. He wants maybe some of the privileges, but he doesn't want to be a man he doesn't want to lead. That may be harsh, but it's true because that's, look through scripture and talk, look at what it means to be a guy. And to be a man, not a guy, a man and a husband in the lead. So we have a whole group of like men that really don't want to be men and they don't want to lead. That's not biblical. So guys have to look deep down inside and say, hey, if I, get, if I call myself a Christian, I need to lead biblically. If you give advice and say this is what it means, and that husband, that guy doesn't want to follow that, he doesn't really want to be a husband biblically. It's just, that's just the truth. You don't want, right? So if you get, what it, no matter what it is, here's how to get out of a relationship. Okay, I don't want to. Well, good luck. Here's how to help a relationship. Well, I don't want to do that. Okay, good luck. Here's how to get a new job. I don't really want to. Okay. Well, then you really like your job. No, you don't. Well, you really do. Why? Because you don't want to do what it takes to get out of it. You'd rather watch Netflix every day than learning a new trade or whatever it may be. You like the situation that you're in. You're really not at wit's end yet. You like your wit's end. You like the drama. You like the situation. You like having the things that are going on around you. But if you're really calm, I need to get out of this. I'm at wit's end. I'm done. Read Psalms 107. Get biblical wisdom into your life. You go, what does it really mean to fulfill this role and to do this and to do that? You realize the scripture talks about everything. It talks about parenting. It talks about a work ethic. I mean, everything it talks about, it's there. We just have to follow it. The second thing that we learn here is fear not. Fear not. John 12, 14 says this. It says, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, we sat on it. He says, fear not, dire daughter of Zion. Behold, the king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Fear not. Here's what's interesting. Here's what I found. So either do not fear or fear not or something along though that phrase, right, in the Bible is mentioned 365 times. And I was like, that is a strange coincidence that I don't think is a coincidence. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that is not a coincidence. That there is a, something about fear not for every day of the year. Fear not. Fear not. Put your trust in God and don't be afraid. <clears throat> don't be afraid. Fear not. I get it. It is a lot easier to stand up on stages and tell people, hey, don't worry, it's going to work out. Than it is to live that out about 3 o'clock this afternoon. You may remember it through lunch, but that's about it. <laughs> right? That's about it. But then we're going to go back to being stressed and worrying about paying bills and taxes and all that kind of stuff. When God tells us don't fear, it's not a bad thing. It's a good command. It's a good command. Now, it doesn't mean we just simply say, hey, I'm not going to fear, don't fear. Hey, I'm going to let God take care of it. We're not going to listen to God's advice. Because that's like half of how God works in our lives. He puts people who have godly advice to help us do things. So we don't have to get ourselves at what's in. So you don't have to go through the stuff that we have to go through. But we don't like to listen to God's advice so many times. It's a huge way, but don't fear. And here's what you really have to understand. Fear sells. Fear sells in the church community. Fear sells outside the church community. Inside of faith, outside of faith, I don't care what faith background, fear sells. Outside of mainstream media, fear sells. Inside of mainstream media, fear sells. Sells. It doesn't matter what area of life. I don't care if you're just starting a media company or you're been around the longest.
the easiest way to get people to watch is to promote fear someplace, somewhere. It is. He doesn't, in God's mind, saying, don't fear. Don't worry. Don't be scared. Fear not. And it's not the idea that he's all controlling. It's that when we continue to do the things that he's called us to do, he'll be with us 24-7. He's got us. If we follow his lead. If we follow his lead. But when we read about it in Psalms 107, they didn't really want to follow his lead until they found themselves at the wit's end. They found themselves empty. And they said, now what do I need to do? Now what? What do I do? I mean, right, we deal with this both like on practical levels. Or how many times do people say, hey, I, they, they finally get healthy, or they say, hey, I finally have to make a change in my health, but it's after they go to the doctor and realize that they are pre diabetic. Right? Um, we, we see this locally, right? A couple of years ago, they asked me to, um, the GLW asked me to be in these school meetings because they wanted to redo all the elementary schools and this or that. And the principal legit asked me at the time, he goes, and one of the teachers, we have a parking problem. If you want to see something funny, <laughs> it's not funny, but if you're ever bored at about 2.55 to about 3.05, 3.10, right, go sit between GLW and the high school <laughs> and just watch the chaos ensue, okay? Because there's a parking issue. So I remember sitting in this meeting and going, hey, what's the issue? And I was like, parking at GLW. If you're gonna spend money on something, spend money on like drop off and pick up line parking issues at GLW for parents, Kids are gonna get hit, right? We spent more talking time talking about murals and paintings than anything weird things, so I just quit and left and said that's it, forget it. <laughs> but just tell you the truth, it was a waste of my time. But what? Well, this isn't really an issue right now because the kid hasn't got hit. And we do the same things that the system does. We are we are reactive on things rather than being proactive on things. Right? He's like, well, nobody's got hit yet, so we're not facing a lawsuit yet. So we're not going to do anything. Well, we're not going to really change anything in my marriage until it goes to the crappers, and now we're going to try to do something, right? Or whatever the case may be, right? We are, we are really, really good at being reactive rather than being proactive. And I think we really need to do a much better job in the Christian community about being proactive in every area of our lives rather than reactive, right? There's five areas to your life. You have your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, your relationship health, your relational health, however you want to look at it, and your spiritual health. There's five areas of, life, of every single person's life. If we become proactive rather than reactive in those five areas, we will see ourselves much healthier in all five areas or we will just in this constant cycle that we read about in Psalms 107. We're just constantly at our wit's end. Why? Because we are always, always being proactive rather than reactive. And this is both in this church and outside of church too, right? Our camp that we send our kids to every year. Pro or reactive instead of proactive. You know how I know? There's a little road that goes through, just like school zones where everybody has to slow down to 15 miles an hour and because kids are running through camp all the time. And guess what happened a couple years ago? Kid wasn't paying attention, car wasn't paying attention. Girl got hit by a car. Well, guess what? Now, now they're trying to raise funds to build a tunnel underneath the road so that kids can go underneath the road rather than cross the road because a kid got hit by a car. They're being reactive instead of proactive. And it's probably a couple trains of thought, right? It's probably a lot easier to raise money when somebody got hit by a car, rather than eventual when somebody could possibly happen. It just, why? Because it, it sells us more than anything. So it's always easier to be pro, uh, reactive than proactive. But we do the same thing. All right? Adults do the same thing that we ridicule our kids for. You know how I know? You can never have a test and you tell them to study for like a couple, like, right? Study for an hour for two weeks straight for this test. Even though we studied for three hours the night before the test, okay? And that's what they're going to do too, right? So the night before they haven't studied at all, never read the book, never watched the video, never did anything for it. Now they're going to cram. Hope y'all got through college, so it won't be so hard on them, <laughs> okay? 
But that's what we do in our lives. We are reactive rather than proactive. Fear not. Fear not. Fear or faith is the opposite of fear, but faith takes action. It's not forcing something, it's choosing something. You're choosing to believe that God's way is better than your way, better than my way. It's choosing, your, it's choosing God's future for your life and God's marriage for your life and God's career for your life rather than your own. Fear not. Fear not. They had to bring him a donkey and a colt, which would have been like a foal, like the baby donkey, which is always interesting, right? Like, can you imagine, like, hey, uh, we're a couple miles out of the city. There's going to be, like, a donkey a couple miles away. Can you go get it for me? <laughs> what are you talking about, Jesus? Yeah, there's going to be this donkey just sitting there. Go steal it. <laughs> you want me to do what? <laughs> yeah, dude, you're going to take that this donkey and this colt for me. Appreciate it. Did the pastor just ask me to go steal stuff? Like, <laughs> what, the, what is going on? That took faith for them to walk along. Because we were kind of read stories, and we tend to think, like, oh, that was like 50 yards. And he just kind of stopped, and we can, like, see the colt in the distance. And then another guy, guy's like, yeah, come take it from me. No. That's not how this thing played itself out. They would have probably been a couple miles away, having to go on, like, a couple mile hike to get this thing. Like, where is this thing? Is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? Always interesting to me. But here's what you have to know. Here's what you have to know. If it's biblical, again, if it's biblical action that somebody's telling you to do that you're reading, if, if it's biblical, it's a big if, you better do it. Because if not, it gets harder and harder and harder. Because the devil wins every time we don't act on the biblical faith and the biblical teachings that we know we're supposed to do. No matter what it is. Every time we say no to something God is telling us to do, or just knowing that we should do, it becomes harder and harder and harder to do it. Being proactive means acting in faith even when our feelings don't match it. That's faith. We cry out, save us, save us, save us, save me now, save me now, save me now. We cry out, fear not, fear not, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. The third hard truth that we see is Jesus never comes the way we expect it. Because what we want is we want somebody to come and solve every issue, and this is what we expect to happen. God's like, no. If we really want to be honest, we want the other person or somebody else to solve, right? Because it's our boss's fault we're not getting a raise. It's our boss's fault we're not getting a promotion. It's our spouse's fault the marriage is bad, right? It's not your fault. It's always somebody else's fault. It's the teacher's fault my grades stink so bad. Whatever it is, right? Whatever it is. Especially if you're homeschooled, it's always the mom's fault. <laughs> right? Like, at least that's what I always blame it on, right? It's mom, it's your fault. What are you talking about? That's what the book says. Uh huh. Oh, oops. Right? It's always, we always like to pass the blame to somebody else. Because it's not what we expect. We have something in our head. Let's go back to John. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming. Your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now here's it is. The paraphrase of Zechariah 9.9. Here's what it says in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, Jesus is coming, but it's not going to be the way you expect him to come. So when kings would ride in in this day and age, when they would ride into the town, they would not only have like a regular horse, right now a donkey, by the way, a regular horse, but if you were a soldier, you would find the, you would find the biggest, tallest horses you can. Right? Have you ever been around horses? I grew up in Colorado, I used to ride horses, all this kind of stuff. You'd measure them by hands. And the hands would go from the feet to the shoulder. And that's how you would measure the hands or the size of a horse. And so soldiers wanted the biggest horses because they're like, dude, bigger the horse, bigger the man. It's kind of like the, the way I kind of look at it. <laughs> we'll be nice. You know, the big guys with the lifts trucks that are actually five foot two, you know what I mean? Like, right? They have to have like a step ladder to get up into their, up into their truck. <laughs> that would be hilarious to watch. Anyways. <laughs> no, anyways, like, right? Like, that would be the soldiers. So they had to have the biggest horses they could. Now the king would, would always still find the horse that was trying to be at least two to three hands bigger than the rest of the soldiers' horses. And this guy, as a king, comes running in on a donkey. 
Not only is it a donkey, but it's the donkey's colt. It's the foal. It's the baby. So every single picture that you will see this week or today or last week or ever of Palm Sunday and Jesus riding in on a donkey is a bunch of junk. It is. It's a lie. He would have been riding in on the colt, the foal, and his legs probably would have been almost touching the ground, right? He would have had to be like this. Like, this dude is riding in on a little shuttle pony, right? Like, it just would have looked ridiculous drawing pictures for thousands of years of him like this, like, <laughs> okay. like, like, but that's probably the most accurate biblical picture that you could possibly have of Jesus actually on Palm Sunday. But that just makes him look like a complete fool. But that's what he was. That's how he rode in. So they would have been riding in like, this is the king? He's supposed to take over the Roman government? He's supposed to come in and demolish a system, clean house? And he's riding in on this pipsqueak? His feet are dragging the ground! Because they were expecting somebody to come in and legitimately take over the Roman Empire. Because if you think our government is twisted, this is like 100 times worse than that. Right? You put together all the sick and twisted governments from around the world that you can have right now, from like North Korea and China, and they're just all, all the bad ones, right? Put Iran and Russia and North Korea and China, mix them all into one, poof, you've got the Roman Empire. And it collapsed, don't worry, all those will collapse too. <laughs> and so he was expecting Jesus to come running in and save the day. So they're expecting him to come running in and like, a horse that's like just ginormous, right? And he's coming along on a pipsqueak. Like, this is what he's doing? That's what they were expecting to take over the Roman Empire, to empty out the system. And he didn't do it. He's not coming as you think. He's probably not going to help you as you think. It's going to probably come in a way that you really don't want to do it. But I don't want to. I can't count how many times I've chatted with people and they go, okay. They may not say I don't want to, but their voice sounds really disappointed in your advice. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, you don't have like a silver bullet for me? I don't. I don't. But we can get, let's start by making one good decision so we can make another good decision so we can make another one. And so a lot of times it just simply comes along the, the idea, godly biblical wisdom simply is you know it when you go, I don't really want to. Right? <laughs> but I don't want to. It's not like that bad. <laughs> but I don't want to. That's it. It's not coming as you think. It's not coming as you think. See, Jesus, Zacharias is the guy. Jesus is coming. The king's coming. He's bringing salvation. He's bringing all. He's bringing life. He's bringing all the stuff. But it's not going to happen the way you think. And it changed their life forever. I heard this statement. I heard this statement. When Jesus was being who they wanted him to be, they gave him palms, they praised him. And who they wanted him to be was a king, like a physical king. But when Jesus was being who they needed him to be, a savior, they gave him crown. We do that. We do that. We want God to come in and save a, a temporary solution to a permanent problem. And God's like, I didn't come to give you a temporary solution. I came to solve a permanent problem. Eternity. That's what I came for. I'm coming, but not as you expect. I'm not coming to solve something temporary. I'm coming to solve it permanently. You want a permanent solution to your career? Follow me. You want a permanent solution to your marriage? Do what I tell you. You want a permanent solution to raising kids? As hard as that is, follow my lead. Follow my lead. You want a permanent solution to how to deal with coworkers? Read my word. You want a permanent solution to, to friends and teachers? Do what I tell you. Follow my lead. Live with the morals and the values that I've instructed. The only way our culture changes is if we do what God says. Amen. The only way. You probably never get there. But you should. 
When you act in faith, when you do what you should do, when you trust in God as your Savior, He knows that. He knows that. They had, some of them did. Some of them were there and they watched him come in and it wasn't how they expected. And like, this dude's a fool. We wanted somebody to come in and take over. And he's riding in on a baby donkey. Are you kidding me? No, it was going to be how we expected it. We don't always like it. I read the Bible quite often. <laughs> okay? I don't always read it like what it says. And I have a choice I have to make. Do I follow what the Bible says or do I follow and do what I want to do? And I'm a person like you guys are. And there's times where I follow, do my best to follow what the Bible says. And there's times where I look back and I'm like, yeah, I didn't do what the Bible said. I didn't have the self-control that the Bible says I should have. Like, oh, oops. My bad. Sorry. You know, like, and so what you do is you just don't keep com compounding the problem. But isn't that what we do because we're so prideful? We react a certain way. We don't want to make it wrong. So then we just keep compounding and we keep stack piling stuff. And then we find ourselves at our wits end and like, I don't know how that fell apart. Well, it was just one little thing after another. After another. After another. And that's really how you know whether or not you do something God's way or not. You following godly advice? When you hear it, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to say, all right, I want to lay down what I really, what I, what I feel like doing because I know it's God and I want to trust when I do what God says, God is beginning to move in my life. Well, how many times do we pray, God save me, God save me, God save me. And God's like, I've told you how to do this, but you don't want to do it. So I can't. Because until your faith with action, then I can move into your situation. But you have to do it first. I'm here with you to help you through it. But you're calling out, save me now, because you're at your wit's end. He's like, I told you what to do. I've laid it out for you. I even gave you somebody to, to explain it to you in common sense. But you didn't want to hear what they had to say. Do it. Just do it. This is why we spent four weeks reading scripture and, and, and teaching why the Bible is so true and how you know it's true and all this stuff. Why? Because this is really what it boils down to. If we don't want to know, if you don't know, no, 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 scripture is true. It's the authoritative word of God. It is awesome. It is impactful. It can change your life. It's just a bunch of stories and you're really not going to follow it. And it just becomes another religious activity to make yourself feel better about yourself. But when it's God's authoritative for you, it can change your life. It is impactful. And you follow it. And it can change the, your career. It can change a relationship. It can change you from, and it does change you from the inside out. But only if we follow what it says, even when you're yelling and screaming, God save me not. Don't just look for a temporary solution. Christ came to change us permanently. He came to hear from heaven to forgive our sins and to, and to change our life. Are we willing to do the things that he says to do? Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every week I try to end some, at some point in time in the sermon, I end with a take home. And it's just this little idea of something to like, here's one little thought. It's kind of a nugget. I try to make it like, the sermon in a sentence. Right? Everything, 35 minutes wrapped into one little sentence, and here's what I got. Do you trust God? If you follow what he says, do you trust him that he will come through? Or do you want to solve the, uh, the issue of whatever your wit's end is your way? Right? What's your wit's end? I'm at this. I don't know what to do about that. This is bothering me. I got this over my shoulders, and I got this on my plate. Are you willing to dive into God's word and do what he says? Or do you just want to do it his way or your way and you want him to agree with you? I don't know. I can't make that decision for you. But Jesus came in ways that they didn't expect. And there's going to be things that he tells you to do that you're not expecting either. 
And sometimes we know it. Because you can be in church long enough. And some of the dangers actually about growing up in church is that I can know it, but it's a lot easier. It's so much easier to know it in here than to know it in here to live it out there. And knowing in here doesn't really mean much. I have to live it. I have to live it. Do I trust God? See, make this personal. Do I trust God that if I follow what he says, that he will come through for me? Or do I want to solve my issues myself, my way, and not his? We all have to do this. And on this Palm Sunday, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and they were praising him, and going, you're awesome, yay, freedom! 2024! I won't go there. But it didn't come the way they expected. He came to bring a permanent solution, and they're all hoping for something temporary. This is what I'm about. I'm telling you, God will change your life permanently if you do things this way. But only if you do things this way. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for Palm Sunday and your scripture and your word and the stories. I thank you for being a little different, for blowing our minds and their minds and not coming the way that they thought you would. Lord, we all will find ourselves in different seasons of the life where we think we are what's in, where it feels like we just don't have solutions and we don't have answers. Lord, give us strength to find those answers in your word and to do what you say. Because when Christians do what you say, it's life-changing for the people around them. It's life-changing for our lives, it's life-changing for our careers, our families, and most importantly, it's life-changing for your kingdom. So Lord, this morning we simply would ask that we would ask ourselves that question. Do we trust you when we are at our wit's end to do what you say and that you're going to come through and deliver us from our distresses and sins in Psalm 107? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Don't forget, game night, Wednesday, 6.30. Have a great one, guys. Yeah.